Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? A warm welcome to this perhaps last session of the day. I hope you're good. I hope you've learned a lot these last couple of days that you also networked and had good times. I am uh, happy and grateful to be allowed to uh, round off the day a little bit. <laughs> I'll be, um, this is part of the off track, as you know. So we'll go a bit off topic bit more philosophical, a bit more entertaining, I think. <laughs> you don't have to be taking notes about sort of things to implement on Monday from, from this talk. I don't expect that. Uh, if someone does, I will be very positively surprised. So it's, it's more about sharing some, um, some insights uh, I've made in my work with, uh, you know, on the edge of technology over the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, stop me at any time, shoot some questions. Otherwise, just lean back and uh, enjoy rounding off this eventful day. Cool? All right, let's get going. So, the topic of today is what we... <laughs> the term I like to use is the wetware frontier. So, wetware, obviously, something being in contrast to hardware and software, something we are used to, to working with. Uh, and wetware being, of course, the biological uh, systems. I am a uh, biohacker since many years. I've worked with hacking biological systems. I've also spent a fair bit of time, perhaps some of you guys have as well, hacking uh, digital systems. But there's a lot of fun things we can do also with the biological systems these days. So um, uh, I'm Hannes, Sapiens Showblood. I use this label, Sapiens, you know, tongue in cheek a little bit. What was the point of a silly uh, middle name? Well. For me, it, it's a statement somehow. It's that uh, it's a label of what I currently am. And uh, I'm currently of the species Homo sapiens. Maybe one day I'll be something else. And that is, uh, then I'll change the label. And um, thinking simply of the concept that we right now, all of us in this room are Homo sapiens. We belong to the same species. We know that before us, there has been 30 to 40 different species of humans, many of them as intelligent as we are. Homo neanderthalensis or Homo florensis, and uh, there are new species being discovered uh, all the time. We have the newly found dragon uh, man in China, for example. So um, maybe with that insight, there has been many species before us, and we are here now, potentially one day there will be something else. And that is what I'm very curious about exploring, you know, both theoretically and also very practically in my work as a biohacker. So essentially what I do uh, is I try to explore the edge of technology, um, practically and in theory. Uh, so I'm one of the founders of this Swedish Biohackers Association, Bionific, and uh, I'm also founded a couple of different startups, to AI startups, or let's say generative AI, Syn data, we do synthetic data, and Miyuchi, we do synthetic voices to make audiobooks. I'm also one of the founders of the Swedish longevity cluster. We are looking at technologies and solutions to extend human lifespans and health spans. So um, uh, there are a lot of things to do <laughs> when you're excited about uh, shaping the future, right? Uh, so, but what, what will we cover today? So, I want to give you guys, maybe some of you so are well read into it, but I, I think there's deserves to get some, some terminology down. So what are human enhancement and augmentation technologies? Where do we stand today? What are they good for? What can they be used for? Um, how widely adopted are they? Uh, matter of definition, obviously. And uh, then again, of course, some considerations when we start playing with these things, what, where we may end up and what, you know, what we should perhaps be aware of. All right. Stop me at any time. I enjoy more of a dialogue than a, uh, you know, a monologue here. So feel free. So what is human enhancement? Essentially, it's, it's not if you have lost your hearing that you get a hearing aid, right? Because that's about replacement or restoring something that was lost. Human enhancement is using technology to give us functions in our bodies and our minds that weren't there before. So, increasing human capabilities through technology beyond the baseline. Somewhat simplified, 
there are three areas of human augmentation technologies. We have the pharmaceutical interventions, we can say. We have the cybernetics category, which is, of course, electronics and software. And then we have genetics. <laughs> so let's get a little bit deeper into a few of those. Uh, quickly, so pharmacology-based human enhancements, that's the pills we take in order to stay healthier and improve productivity. So uh, I would assume a lot of you guys have been, for example, taking the cognitive enhancer caffeine today. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, if you have a certain diagnosis, you may also be given access to limited substances such as Ritalin or Midafinil, which is uh, treatments for, uh, for example, for narcolepsy. That also is known for people who do not suffer from narcolepsy to significantly improve you know, focus and productivity in the workplace. So the effect you know, of um, pharmaceutical interventions is, of course, usually temporary. So they, they cling off after a short while. This is also a developed industry. Pharmacology has been around. It's well-researched, well-established. Distribution systems are built out, the rules and regulations are relatively clearly set. Um, there is also, you can say, there is a difference oftentimes between the regulatory dimension and what people uh, want to do with certain substances. Uh, not necessarily narcotics, but for example, this category of what we call nootropics, uh, which is this uh, cognitive performance enhancing substances that you can buy in pharmacies uh, online and offline. In some countries, they're quite tightly regulated, such as Sweden, whereas in other countries, you can often get them over the counter. So if any of you have seen the movie Limitless with Brad Cooper, uh, this is a book, or th that movie is about uh, applications of, of modafinil. Of course, somewhat, um, you know, Hollywoodified, but it's essentially what it is. Obvious other illustration of a pharmaceutical or pharmacological in intervention into human bodies is how uh, using steroids for physical performance. So this is a bodybuilder from 100 years ago compared to a bodybuilder uh, from 20 years ago, and how uh, we've through uh, human augmentation technologies in this instance can see the, the physical transformation and being able to do things and look in ways that were simply not possible before we had those interventions. Like it or not, guys, I know you can have different opinions if this is good or not. Use of steroids is even illegal in this country. Uh, the police will uh, come to the gym and force you to take it, uh, a test if they uh, suspect that this is happening. But let's just say it's out there, right? Genetics. Uh, we can come back to pharma if you want to, but I, I think I'll focus on the more exciting dimensions. So genetic human enhancement is something which is, of course, still very experimental. Uh, it's very strongly regulated. In fact, there are only three, four countries in the world that work on genetic modification on humans. Sweden is one of them. So is US, UK and um, China and, of course, a handful of others but uh, it's very tightly regulated. So, for example, if you genetically modify an, a human embryo, which is allowed in Sweden, you need to destroy it after two weeks. So it cannot, can never grow to maturity. So there are some very powerful applications of genetic therapies in medicine, such as, for example, restoring bone marrow of an individual who has, who has suffered from uh, bone cancer. Uh, interestingly enough, this domain is being rapidly transformed in terms of cost and accessibility. You've probably heard of CRISPR. There are many versions of CRISPR, which is a way of uh, using enzymes for modifying uh, ge uh, genomes in living organisms. And uh, this was discovered not even 10 years ago, already been awarded a Nobel Prize. And it's also a technology that is widely available. It doesn't cost a lot to start modifying living organisms such as bacteria. I've done it myself in, a, in our wet biohack space in, uh, in the makerspace in Stockholm. So it's, uh, it doesn't have to be complicated. So essentially what is driving this transformation in, um, in uh, genetics is that biology 
is becoming an information technology. We can, we can monitor biological systems from our own bodies to whole ecosystems by use of cameras and sensors and large and small, right? Anything from satellites to implants. And the other dimension being that we are able to read the genetic code of organisms, the cost of which has fallen by factors of 1,000 over just the last decade, and that we also can write genetic code and input that into living organisms. Uh, it's a fascinating new domain, and many of you uh, guys and girls are working with software, and I would love for you to, together with me, explore how the bridge between computer software and biological software uh, you know, can be explored and how we can apply all the insights you guys and skills you guys have into the domain of programming biology, because that is a very fascinating frontier. Let me give you an example of the digitalization of biology. <clears throat> Pandemic. Um, in um, January 2020, uh, um, the CEO, Stefan of Moderna, he was sitting in his office, or no, he was sitting at his breakfast table reading the news on his iPad when he saw a news item, oh, there's a new virus outbreak in Wuhan in China. I mean, those outbreaks happen regularly in different places. So he just sent off an email to his uh, research colleagues. Hey, you guys, can you check, uh, you know, what kind of a virus that the one in Wuhan is? And his colleagues replied, sure, the Chinese guys are just sequencing the genome. We'll have it this afternoon. And ping in his inbox a couple of hours later was the full genome of the COVID virus. Now, this was in January 2020, before the first individual carrying the virus inside them actually entered the shores of the United States of America or Europe. So the digital copy of the virus traveled much, much faster around the world than the biological version. What are the effects? What were the effects of that? Well, the COVID pandemic, in my view, was the first battle in the last war between humans and viruses, we won. In the previous biggest pandemic we saw, the uh, Spanish flu 100 years ago, more than 50 million people died. Does anyone in here know how many people died from COVID? According to UN estimates, it's about 6 million people. Um, we also had more than uh, about a billion uh, infected cases that were documented, and we distributed more than 13 billion doses of vaccines to humankind. So we mobilized our digital technologies, anything from apps to masks to uh, coding of uh, vaccines, and we accelerated, and we won that fight. And you know what? We have never, ever been better prepared for pandemics than we are today. So I think the next one is not even going to bother us at all. And this, for me, is an illustration of the power of uh, uh, the digitalization of biology. We can simply outsmart nature now in an increasing number of ways. Let me give you another fun example. Mm, any of you guys recall there was this uh, huge conference in Paris, the climate conference in Paris, in December 2015. All the world leaders were there. Uh, UN, the thousands of journalists from every news media, tens of thousands of activists and lobbyists, they were all there wanting to, you know, now we must get climate change solved. We must have these regulations on emissions, etc. So there was a lot of hoo-ha and a lot of debate before and after and during this event. But did you know that exactly at the same time there was another conference? The world's first human gene editing summit. Because what had happened in just that year, 2015, was this, the discovery of CRISPR. Uh, the gene editing cheap, simple, and precise gene editing technology. And the scientists suddenly dawned on them, holy smoke, we have this marvelously powerful technology in front of us, and it's being applied in labs everywhere. Maybe we should get together. This was like an emergency meeting. 
maybe we should get together and get some rules written down pretty quickly <laughs> about what we can do and not do with this technology. And so they did. Uh, so as you can see, it was organized by the Academies of Sciences of the world's leading nations. This event was covered by a single reporter <laughs> who had just happened to you know, read about it the day before. I personally think this conference will impact the future of our planet and our species a hundred times more than that climate summit that took place in Paris and got all the attention at the same time. And lo and behold, three years later comes the second international summit on human gene editing. And maybe you've seen this picture and this gentleman, uh, He Yang Kui, Chinese researcher. He goes on stage at this second event and said, yeah, I know it's not allowed, but you know what? I genetically modified a, a couple of kids who have no, now been born. And he did. So specifically what he did was he, uh, there was, a, if I recall correctly, a, a, two kids whose parents were HIV positive. And there are certain genes that protect kids to get uh, HIV from their parents while uh, in gestation. And so he, not perfectly, but he introduced these genes into these embryos and then they were carried and these girls were born. And as far as we know, as far as science currently knows, these are healthy uh, young uh, girls today. So obviously this was a breach of rules. He Yang Kui was put in, in uh, not in prison, but he was confined to his home until further and he was ostracized in the scientific community. But this goes to demonstrate, in my view, that this technology is here, it's being used. Just like the whole debate we've had about AI over the last year, right? Everyone is saying, oh, we must be careful with this, we must be careful with that. I personally think that this technology, the digital biology applications to our own species, are just as important and just as powerful as the discussion uh, and the, about the impact of artificial intelligence on our civilization and on ourselves. If you're curious about learning more, I mean, you can do a lot of searches, but there is a fantastic gentleman at the conference. I don't know if he's here, Anton. Uh, he had a workshop uh, the day before yesterday here. I don't know if any, any of you guys attended, but Anton is also on tomorrow uh, speaking more about biological aging and how we can apply smart technologies for extending human lifespans. So I can highly recommend going there in case you didn't already plan to. Um, all right, so... We'll be back with, on the genetics, I think, at the end as well. But I want to spend a few minutes on the uh, cybernetic enhancement dimensions because I think those are the ones perhaps closest to, to what we are here for uh, at Aradev and what we understand, but also the field that, a field that is showing some very interesting uh, changes at the moment. So what is cybernetic enhancement? Well, it's smart electronics on and in our bodies. And... Um, anything that sort of gives sensory outputs and feedbacks and whatnot, right? Uh, so these technologies are about giving new capabilities to healthy people. So it's not just about restoring functions or medical functions, pacemakers, insulin pumps, uh, these things, but things that instead add value to the body. And there are three areas for this human enhancement stuff. It's the health monitoring, dimension, it's improving senses and, you know, body functions, uh, such as strength, being able to run, carry, other things, and also the cognitive improvement dimension. So here's a rough listing. I'm not going to go through this uh, in extensio, but principally here's a, a mapping we did about a year ago about sort of the low-end things where you have fitness wearables that log stuff up to connecting things and ultimately Neuralink implants in your brain. And you can see that some of them you can remove, some are integrated with the body, um, and then some product examples that are uh, more or less in the market of these products. So if you want to discuss any of this deeper, please get in touch with me. But I'll just give you a couple of examples. Exobionics is a company that does exoskeletons, not for military applications, but for workplace, uh, workplace applications. So letting people carry heavier stuff, uh, keep heavy tools without getting hurt and increasing their strength and endurance for various tasks. 
Uh, Open Bionics is another fun example. It's a company that does prosthetics for children, giving them new functions. Uh, what they do beautifully is that they uh, also make them sci-fi. So instead of trying to mimic a, like a rubber hand to make it as human looking as possible, they make them sci-fi themed, such as Alita Battle Angel or Star Wars inspired, making it a statement. And I think it's something fascinating. You can also add functions. You can implant or you can input sensors and smartphone functions, etc., in these devices. And the, another pop culture feature of this is when one of these young kids gets a hero arm, as they're called, and they go on Twitter or Instagram, they often get a shout out from Mark Hamill, uh, who is, of course, the original uh, representative of people losing an arm uh, in his role as Luke Skywalker. Um, all right, so, but there's a multitude of these things. Anything from implants, smart dental devices, smart braces, uh, augmented reality headsets, etc. And of course, one of my fond memories from Eredev. I don't know if any of you guys were here, was it 2015? When we had a chip implant station. Any of you guys? All right, we have a couple of veterans here. Good to see you guys. So um, I think it was about 60 people who decided to get the chip implant that day. Uh, and, um, you know, we had a good time and we learned a few things about the applications of this technology. I still think chip implants are a lot of fun. I have a, a couple of them myself still in my system. Uh, for example, a small implant up here that measures my body temperature at all times. So if I get a fever, I swipe myself, I know when to control it and when it's fading away. Now, had I been a woman with a, a monthly cycle, I would also be able to monitor uh, you know, my ovulation, for example, by way of logging my temperature with, with such a temp implant. So uh, there's some basic, safe, well-established applications of these technologies already in the market today. Here's like a <clears throat> brief, maybe you can't see this color too well, a highlight of um, you know, where do we stand in terms of commercial applications of this. So the um, beige um, boxes here, they, they show simply th there are already significant consumer uptake of these technologies. That includes augmented reality headsets, wearables, of course, but also insertables of certain kinds. Um, we have some niche industry applications for exoskeletons or devices that you can swallow and or implants that you insert. And I still categorize sort of the brain computer interfaces that, we, that get a fair bit of attention online as still very speculative. And let me just give you my super quick take on Neuralink because it often comes up in these conversations. So um, Neuralink, if someone doesn't know, is one of the projects, sort of moonshot projects that is run by Elon Musk, along with his other projects, uh, which is about creating a human brain interface. So you can really, by thinking, accessing all of the internet without having to go through these clumsy uh, monkey hands or, uh, or through the eyes, but directly into the processing system. So there were some news recently, they started with human trials for these brain implants, but the comparison I, I like to give is, which is interesting because uh, the numbers fit so well, is that um, the human brain has about 86 billion neurons. That's roughly the same number as there are trees in the country of Sweden. Sweden is a large country, it's also to a very large extent forested. Now, all these trees have um, branches and twigs, just like these neurons in our brains have synapses that connect to others in the magnitude of about 10,000 for each neuron. And the Neuralink has 1,024 electrodes. So about as a two, couple of toothbrushes. So if you want to understand the forest system of Sweden and the complexity of that system by the use of two toothbrushes, I think you are still quite far away <laughs> from doing meaningful things. So it's very experimental. It may help people who are quadriplegic or are completely locked in and don't, cannot move any of the limbs, but it's still very, very far from, from real applications in my view. All right, we have a few more minutes. I want to get into the um, 
a little bit into the why argumentation about what, why these technologies are interesting. So essentially, when you look at human history, it's been a, a journey of emancipation. So in this case, farm workers going up to the monarch and challenging the landlord for better wages or better work hours. But principally, we have always worked towards, and we define progress of civilization as having greater freedoms and being able to access you know, more value in our lives and being more free. And this is what human enhancement technologies also do, but in a novel dimension, because it's about freeing us a little bit from what limits us as humans. Our short lifespans, for example, our fragility in, uh, for example, the amount of temperatures we can stand or, or the pressure or the, uh, you know, the environment, the environmental circumstances that significantly limit us, where the world we can inhabit. And of course, that we suffer from disease and damages. Uh, so my view and my reason for my interest in human enhancement technologies is that I think that our species that evolved in a very different circumstances than the world we live in today. We evolved in biologically in, you know, as hunter-gatherers living in small tribes. And now we live in a welfare societies with an abundance of calories, with a massive bombardment of information at all times of day and night. We're meeting thousands of people every day in our interactions. Uh, it's very stressful for us in some ways, both for our immune systems, for our mental health, etc. And maybe the solution is not like going back to the Stone Age in terms of what we do. Of course, it's nice to go out to nature. Maybe the issue is with us. Maybe it's us that we, we need to upgrade our functions to be in tune with the times, with modern society, with an information society. I mean, if you look at the human body, you can see uh, fossils in our systems in the sense that um, well, let me give you just a couple of fun examples. You can see that um, over the evolution of, of our species, what has happened is that, that the chin has grown smaller and smaller. And one of the effects being that we still have the same number of teeth as, uh, as uh, our uh, predecessors have much bigger jaws. And that means that we now have too many teeth and they always get cramped up. So nine out of 10 people have very uneven teeth in the lower jaw and they get pain and we need to remove the, the wisdom teeth from the back as an example of a fossil. Another interesting observation is of course that there are no other, um, uh, I lost the word, animals with a backbone. Mammals, no mammals or something. Vertebrates, thank you, thank you, that, uh, that walk on two legs. So, um, uh, with the exception of, if you, you can technically define a couple of birds like ostriches, but they have a different spine uh, curvature and they also have a, a much bigger back. So, but what we've done is just, we, we took this four leg person because vertebrates are designed to walk on four legs and we start walking on two. And that means we have the spine on one side and all the weight on the other side. <laughs> That's why we all get uh, back aches. So we're simply not designed for this. If we would go back to the drawing board, we'd probably get into make it in some other way. And, you know, besides joking about our bodies, civilizational level is that what we can see around the world is that our capacity to do harm, to destroy our planet and to harm each other, we have this marvelously powerful weapons and technologies now, so we can ruin ecosystems and destroy countries uh, in very short time spans. And we are still led, many of the countries in the world and systems are led with people with very primitive agendas, which is very tribal. Oh, you guys have some land. I'm going to take that land from you and kill you guys because I don't like the way you speak or the God you pray to. And Maybe it's about time we also upgrade a little bit of the software in our heads so we can move on from those very primitive instincts. I personally think that applying technology to the human body is not something which is unnatural. In fact, it is the most natural thing we can do. It's what makes us human. In, in all civilizations from around the planet, if you look at Egyptian mummies or mummies from uh, the Andean mountains or uh, steppe warriors frozen into the Siberian tundra in Kurgans. 
we all see that they have body modifications. They have tattoos, they have elongated skulls, they have changed their teeth. We've always, always, as a human species, applied technology to modify ourselves. It's what makes us human, the fact that we apply technology. Some animals use tools. Yeah, um, a monkey can take a branch and make a hole, but they will always throw away the branch. They don't keep it and improve it for the next day. We humans, we use technology to augment the world around us, but also ourselves. This is what makes us humans. This is the most natural thing to do. Of course, there are weaknesses. I mean, technology is, is uh, you know, introdu being introduced in our lives. You can say that we're completely codependent on technologies in so many dimensions. I'm sure this is something you've all experienced. The, the sense of loss when your phone is, you can't find your phone or even when the battery has just died. And, and young people today, they, they grow up with, with these devices and their systems being integral, integral to their own cognitive processes. So, I'm coming to the final uh, lap here. What I see are four directions of human enhancement that I think we should actively pursue. The first one being, of course, through genetics and pharmaceuticals, curing uh, aging so that we can live much longer, healthier lives and simply eliminating, for example, genetic disease. There is no reason why children should be born in the world today with genetic disease. We have the means to stop this suffering. We should. We have a moral obligation to. Second dimension is, of course, expanding our perceptual abilities. Because right now, if you look in nature, we got the shortest straw on every sense. We didn't get very good smell if you compared to a lot of our animal friends. We didn't get any eyesight at all if you compared to many of our bird friends. Our hearing is terrible if you compare to many other uh, mammals and beings, etc. I think there is so much beauty in the world that we don't perceive because of the weak senses that we have. Let's explore that beauty. Maybe there's poetry and music to be found in nature and in the universe that are simply beyond our abilities at the present time. Third one being, of course, improving cognitive abilities. How can we improve our memories? How can we improve our focus, concentration, intelligence? There are tools for it, especially with the this advent of artificial intelligence systems that help us process this overwhelming tsunami of information that is flushing over us every day. And then, of course, the hardest area of all, namely our primitive instincts, motivational patterns, such as resource hoarding, short-termism, tribalism, xenophobia, right? Those things served us well when we were hunter-gatherers and you couldn't trust the guys from the one valley over that they were going to take our cattle. But now, when in this integrated, global, cooperative world that we live in, we must get rid of those instincts that someone uh, should, uh, you know, uh, want to kill us just because we speak a different language or have a different skin color. So, some things I learned from being working biohacker and running a business, putting chip implants in people for a number of years. I was, I've been challenged thousands of times for uh, why should I get an implant from you, Hannes? And um, what, what I learned is that when you work with technologies that push the edge of what people are willing to accept, you need to be extra careful. You need to be very considerate and understand the ethics around it. You must make sure that you design technology so that it's, the, uh, the potential for abuse is absolutely minimal. Design for privacy. Be very clear with your code of ethics, what you accept, whom you accept working with. I had uh, numerous requests from military companies or dictatorial states. Hey, Hannes, can, can you come and demonstrate your implant technology for us, how we can use it potentially? And I was very happy to decline those opportunities. The good news, guys, is that there are people who have been thinking a lot about this. There is a cyborg bill of rights out there that has thought through some of these questions. What happens to our rights as humans when we start to put smart technology into our bodies? I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to read through all this, but essentially, for example, the right to that I can always, if some external company owns a device in my body, I will always have the right to control 
you know, if the software is to be updated or not. Who hasn't been frustrated when the suddenly Windows update or, you know, an iOS update on your phone or on your computer and you can't really uh, prevent it from happening and suddenly the whole things change. But for systems that are integrated with your body, we must maintain that right completely. And also the right for police not to seize it, for example, or for listening... Um, listening through these devices and picking up information from you. Anyway, the, the principal philosophical point I want to come to is a philosophical one, which is coined by the philosopher Max Moore. Uh, what rules society a lot today, our politicians and also, for example, medical science decision makers, is the precautionary principle, försiktighetsprincipen, as we say in Swedish. The essence of the precautionary principle is that if you don't understand fully the effects of what you do in a complex system, which obviously is the human body or the society we live in or our genetics, move slowly and carefully. Number one principle being do no harm or minimize the harm we can potentially do. So this is something that stops a lot of the research we see. We see this debate also in AI, right? There's a one percentage chance, some people say, that the AIs are going to be super smart and start a nuclear war. So let's, let's just give the license to 10 companies in the world that they can do AI research and everyone else will not be allowed to. That frightens me in some ways, the, that uh, line of reasoning. I want to draw my sword for the proactionary principle. The proactionary principle is an, it's another value position which is about if the benefits are high enough, the risks are worth taking. This is how you make progress. This is how we can really achieve things such as, let's say that artificial intelligence can help us find a cure against cancer. But if we slow this down, how many million of people are we willing to sacrifice by delaying this insight for, say, 10 years? If there's 1% chance that AI will cure cancer for us, then we should pursue that with all our force or cure aging for that sake. So seeing the risks also in balance of opportunities. And the, sim the way I choose to want to symbolize this is simply that we have people who also move towards danger because they are equipped for it, they understand what it is about, and they have ways of solving the challenges that we see. Like these first responders from when there was a terrorist incident in Stockholm a few years back. All right, summing up, human enhancement is a high risk. I see that too, but it's a very high reward investment because it has the potential to transform our bodies, our health, our civilization, our intelligence in marvelous ways. It will help us emancipate us from the two greatest prisons of all, namely the gravity well of the planet that we're born on, and the meat bags that are the prisons of our consciousnesses. The maintenance system that sits down here that is fragile and will break down uh, you know, in about, at about 80 years of age for most of us, unless we take upon us to solve that challenge. So I think we live in a marvelous time when we are truly breaking out of those two prisons. Yes, we are again becoming a space-faring species. We're going back to the moon and Mars. We are also working to break out of the meat bags. And that is the most exciting development. And I think that will take us into a period of unimaginable human flourishing. We will be an incredibly much richer society as individuals and collectively in the years to come because of these human enhancement technologies. So I think that we humans, we are still at the stage, we're just an acorn who is just about to bloom into a tree. We are just a fraction of our potential right now. And the solution is here. So thank you for listening to this at the end of the day. I hope you got a few thoughts in your mind uh, from this short conversation. If you want to chat more, I'll be around. Thank you very much for today. <laughs>